the, uh, the president of the TPATG, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the executive of TPATG, uh, Bula Vinashan, a very good afternoon to you all. Um, I've just come, uh, finished from parliament, so I'm in a very different state of mind. If I come across as very adversarial, please stop me. Um, but I'd like to uh, very quickly today, um, very briefly talk to you about some of the budget aspects and probably make some general comments uh, regarding the, the economy. Um, and I'd like to probably take you through, through some of the key factors. Uh, Parliament also, for your interest, just this afternoon, passed two uh, bills, um, particularly that affect you uh, as professionals. One is under the name and same uh, provisions, the, the amendment that has been brought about. And the other one, of course, is to do with the um, uh, prosecution of uh, your clients. Um, so you actually have now the ability of FERCUS, as you call it now, FRTS. Some people call it FERCUS, some people call it FIRST. We'll have to agree on how the acronym needs to be pronounced. But uh, um, the, I'll, I'll talk about those two uh, uh, bills that have become next of Parliament now. I want to actually the President actually attends to it in se within seven days' time. So very quickly, just through the budget, ladies and gentlemen, if I can take you through that, to the 2017-2018 budget. Um, the, the economy, of course, uh, now has been growing eight years in a row. Um, and uh, as you can see, the growth has been since 2010. Uh, one of the interesting parts, of course, is that the economy um, uh, slowed down after Cyclone Winston. Um, and we expect at least uh, another three years of projected growth. The recent unemployment statistics shows that unemployment now is the lowest it's ever been in the past 15 years. It's sitting at 5.5%. Uh, however, of course, youth unemployment is higher than 5.5%. There are some issues regarding uh, the actual uh, determination of how the figures are arrived at for youth unemployment. But nonetheless, the fact of the matter is that youth un unemployment is actually higher than 5.5%, but the overall unemployment in Fiji has dropped to 5.5%. Uh, what is also very interesting is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, which I'll show you in the next slide, is that inequality in Fiji has also dropped. The recent study by the World Bank uh, that looks at the Asia-Pacific countries um, has, has Fiji as one of, the, one of the seven countries, only seven countries in the Asia-Pacific region where inequality has actually dropped. So you can find countries where you may have very fast economic growth, the rates are very high, countries like India, but inequality has actually increased. Uh, inequality in countries like Australia and New Zealand actually has increased also. So for a developing country in particular like Fiji, it is very critical for us not only to be focused on economic growth per se, but to ensure that that growth actually is spread across and inequality overall does drop and we do not create a disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And that of course means that you have more participation, equal participation, Within the, within the marketplace, uh, so to speak. What are the areas that have contributed to this growth? Um, I, I hope I'm not repeating myself. I understand somebody did present on the budget, but I hope this, uh, is, is this okay? Have you, have you been through this? Past couple days, is that okay? You've been through this? Yeah. No, okay. Uh, so these are the areas, sorry, that contribute to the growth. I cannot, my, okay. You can see over there, that uh, uh, agriculture is 0.34 percent. Fisheries and forestry is very, very low. Of course, there's a lot of potential there for in that area, but there must be something that we may not necessarily be doing right. So that's what we need to look at. Manufacturing, of course, is quite significant. So is construction. You can see enormous uh, uh, construction works are going on in TV. That generally is an indication of the level of confidence that investors have in the country. And really, if you look at it in TV, there's never been any sort of structured approach or indeed perhaps important place you know, for the construction industry. Uh, today in Fiji, we have companies, because of the shortage of trade people, highly skilled trade people, we have actually construction companies bringing people from Bangladesh, Philippines, and Indonesia. Just only two days ago, I was told about another company that's actually bringing in um, trade people from Bangladesh. It essentially shows, of course, is that there is a gap of those highly specialized trade people, but it means there's a lot of potential for our people too. This is where the three technical, the 13, sorry, technical colleges that fit in to this equation. 
This is why the technical colleges are very, very important. It also goes to show that trade people are very much in demand in the region. A lot of our good trade people have been stolen by the Kiwis in the Christchurch rebuild. So, you know, they obviously have been offering higher rates so people do go there. But today in Fiji, in Suva, you have welders, you know, people who do welding being paid $16, $17 an hour. Electricians are being paid $12, paid $12 13 dollars an hour. Bricklayers are being $7, $8, $9 an hour. They're, that's the rate they are being paid. It is interesting, recently I had, and I've told this story before, um, where I had uh, some construction companies, they came and told me, they said, look, you've got to have some legal, uh, legal framework around the construction industry. And I said, why? He said, well, you know, I had a couple of construction sites. I had my people laying the bricks. I turned up, to, uh, turned up on the site, and they've all disappeared. So where have they gone? They said, gone to the other site, because they're offering them $1.50 more an hour. That's how fluid the market is. So that goes to show there's a lot of demand for that, and that's something that we need to be obviously cognizant about as policy makers uh, and people who are you know, interested in that area. The uh, services sector, of course, ladies and gentlemen, is very important for us. As you can see, the financial services in Fiji, that sector contributes a handsome, uh, you know, has a handsome contribution, and so are the others. We believe there's a lot of potential here for Fiji in the services sector. Uh, just again, very quickly, we had, you know, Mind Pearl, there was, you know, Mind Pearl, when they first set up in Fiji, uh, I did ask them, I said, you know, why, why do you want to come to Fiji? They said, well, you've got a good, relatively good infrastructure in terms of, you know, your telecommunications, etc. You have a young population, you all speak English. Good time zone, you're exactly 12 hours ahead of Greenwich Mean Time. And lastly, which I was not aware of, apparently, we Fijians have neutral accents. So they don't have to spend millions of dollars on us to get our accents to be understood by other people. When they actually go and set up call centers, etc., in places like India and Philippines, they literally spend millions of dollars for them to get those people to change their accents so some American, or Australian, or English person can actually understand them. So, I mean, these are some of the things that we weren't aware of. Mindful, of course, we paid them a rebate for two years on every amount of salary that they did pay to the people they employed. For government, of course, as a from policy perspective, we need to ensure that our economy has a, this broad-based growth to the economy. We simply cannot depend on one or two sectors to contribute to our growth. And in fact, uh, you know, we would argue that that's still relatively high dependency on one or two sectors. You can imagine when Cyclone Winston came along, if Cyclone Winston actually had stayed on the trajectory where they said it would uh, stay on, and went through Suva and Nasinu went through the middle of Viki Levu, therefore affecting the Coral Coast, affecting Nandi, Mamanula, we would have been in a completely different space. Because we are relatively unscathed from the cycle of incident as far as the tourism sector is concerned. We are able to bounce back much quicker than anticipated. But of course, we need to ensure that the risk is therefore mitigated by having broader based growth. We are doing a number of things. One of them, of course, for example, is setting up of the the simulator school in Nandi, uh, the groundbreaking ceremony should be held in the next couple of, uh, or at least a month and a half. That creates a lot of potential revenue for us. At the moment, uh, Fijian pilots, including other pilots from this region, all have to go to Singapore because, as you know, even though you may be a seasoned pilot, after every few hundred hours you have to go and go to the simulator and get those, those points, whatever it is, equivalent to maybe the continuing legal education, what you may have in the accounting profession. Now, once we do that, we're already getting people who are interested in calling up and saying, when, when are you setting up a simulator school? Because it would be a lot more cheaper to send pilots for their simulator courses or, you know, uh, refresher courses from Australia and New Zealand to send them to Fiji and a lot cheaper for them then to do it actually in their own countries too. There's enormous potential there, and that's the one of the areas that we are, we are looking at. Similarly, this is why, for example, we've entered into a partnership with Fiji Airways, you know, the, the $18 million partnership agreement with them with them to actually fly to Singapore. We're flying twice a week now. We hope to do three times very soon. We do San Francisco. Uh, we are looking also at, at Japan very soon. The reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that as we say, Fiji today, or Fiji Airways, flies to every single continent that rims the Pacific Ocean except South America. So that would be your next frontier. The moment you do that, you're suddenly in the center of it all. We already, I would say, three quarters of the center there. So we have to be able to take advantage of these natural sort of hubbing potential that we do have. Inflation, of course, uh, it's, you know, uh, hovered now back down to 2%. 
Uh, we are, of course, price takers as, well, as far as the world fuel price is concerned. This is where the world fuel price, you know, shot through the roof, about $145 a barrel. Today's stabilized, it's just below $50. But of course, it's not just world fuel price, but it's also things like cyclones. A bundle of beans costs $5 after Cyclone Winston. A small bunch of bananas costs, uh, you know, 20 bucks in Suva. Yamora killed today costs $120 a kilo. People still drink it at the same rate. But the fact of the matter is that inflation has now come down. Foreign reserves very high. In fact, uh, this is, uh, in fact, a bit outdated. As announced by the Reserve Bank of Fiji, our foreign reserves has now hit in excess of $2.4 billion. It's no longer $2.3, $2.4 billion. This is the highest it's ever been in Fiji's history in nominal terms. Uh, as you know, the, the, the shredded line here, that four that says that's the number of months. International benchmark rule says that you should have at least four months of trading in uh, with, uh, as far as your foreign reserves are concerned. So we're sitting quite, you know, uh, pretty good there compared to what we were, for example, in 2005. You can see we had only $549 million, 2.3 months of foreign reserves. Of course, notwithstanding the fact that, uh, you know, we are at two point, now $4 billion, 5.8 months worth of uh, uh, foreign reserves of trading, uh, the economy has grown. So the pressure on foreign reserves has been very high. As I've said in the various public consultations, uh, nearly everything that, you know, I could pick anybody in this room uh, that you have on you is probably important. The watch I'm wearing, this ring that I have, the shoes that I have, this suit, maybe the suit is made in Fiji, but the fabric comes from overseas, the gel I have in my hair. I mean, everything is actually important. So we need to be able to have enough foreign reserves to be able to do healthy trading. Colloquially speaking, of course, when you don't have enough foreign reserves, people say, oh, that country is going bankrupt. You, of course, aren't in that particular uh, situation. I'm going through this very quickly. Please, uh, uh, you can ask me any questions later on. A lot of people don't realize one thing I forgot to mention about foreign reserves. You know, uh, companies like Fiji Airways, when they go out and buy three brand new AC30s and borrow funding or borrow money from uh, German banks and European banks, they, one of the first things they do look at is your foreign reserves. Look at your ability to be able to meet your uh, foreign debt, uh, you know, uh, commitments. Uh, so that plays a very healthy role in respect of that. Uh, all governments since independence in Fiji have run deficits. Uh, probably we've had only about three times in our history since independence where we've had a surplus. Some of them by, you know, uh, the fact that uh, we sometimes have had understanding or because, for example, in the 1990s when they sold the good old K uh, the post uh, PNT, which became ATH and then became post CG, uh, because of that one-off sale we had a surplus. Uh, but generally we've had deficit, the deficits. The trick, of course, is to keep these lines not too long. Um, and we, as you can see, as a policy, we, uh, as a government, we've decided to reduce our deficits. But of course, things like cyclones don't uh, help. Uh, Cyclone Winston, of course, we have to go out and borrow at least $220 million, of which $170 million went into rebuilding schools. It damages roads, disturbs water, sewer systems, water pipes, electricity. Nearly 6,000 kilometers of electrical cables went down after Cyclone Winston. We have to rebuild all of that. Uh, those of you who live in Nandi would know that the four-lane road that we have built actually does not have any overhead cables. So that's what we call building resilience into infrastructure because if we had put overhead cables, apart from the aesthetic issue, it does not look very nice. Well, the fact of the matter is that it's all underground, so there's nothing to blow down next time there's a cyclone. It also means we put in water pipes now for, you know, planes that they have to actually have, you know, bigger water pipes to ease down the track. So those are the kind of sort of, um, you know, uh, infrastructure works that are being carried out to ensure that we build resilience into us. Those areas where we put up the electrical cables, God forbid if we have another cyclone this year, those cables will probably come down again if we rebuild again. So we have to think long term in terms of the infrastructure that, spend that we do have to be able to build that resilience. And that costs money now. The point of the matter though now is, ladies and gentlemen, that if you build now, you don't have to spend more money in the future. So those people who argue about debt levels Thing the future generations have to pay is actually a false argument because the fact of the matter is the future generations don't have to build a four-lane road anymore. It's already there. It probably will hold us good way for the next 20, uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, so that's obviously uh, taking the pressure uh, off them. There are still people in Fiji who drink from creeks. There are people who still drink from wells with pet poles in it. 
A lot more people are doing that. Now in the past about nine years, the level of expenditure in uh, uh, utilities has been quite significant. If you go around Fiji now, many people that weren't collected to reticulated water systems, that weren't collect connected to electricity, are now connected. So therefore, that's also increased the productive capacity of uh, those uh, populations and people who actually live uh, in those areas. Uh, total government revenue, uh, I'd like to go through this very quickly. Uh, you can see 2004, government revenue is 1.1 billion. Today it's about 3.8 billion. Government revenue is almost tripled, which is good for us because it means that uh, you know, we have to borrow, don't have to borrow as much, and the government revenue is, is uh, higher. And this is uh, not the same the fact that we've reduced corporate tax to 20%. Companies listed on stock exchange now pay only 10%. That has been reduced from 15 to 9%. Not the that the revenue has actually uh, increased, uh, tripled, I should say. What are the revenue uh, categories that contribute to that uh, revenue collection? Uh, you can see wh what it is. Um, Direct taxes, value-added, customs. We believe that these three areas, we're putting a lot of pressure on focus, or first, as they say now, to collect more. We believe there's still a lot of revenue leakage. Hopefully, none of you are actually contributing to that. Uh, the reality is that we do find some accounting companies are still not necessarily doing the right thing. As I've said on a number of occasions, please, as professionals, whilst you may have clients, you may have certain duties to your clients, it does not mean you become the lackeys of your clients because everybody should comply with the law. And that is very, very important. There needs to be greater compliance with the law. We have found recently accounting firms that have actually been complicit with their clients in actually uh, not paying the right amount of, um, uh, of tax. And uh, we can go into that. There's still a lot of leakage of the customs. Uh, we have uh, a, a gentleman from the New Zealand Customs that's now working with the uh, first in respect of that, but we need a lot more um, uh, development in that area, including direct taxes. So the, the other areas, of course, contribute to that. One interesting one, of course, is, is ECAL, which is the uh, economic, uh, sorry, environmental climate adaptation levy. Uh, that's very important because we actually decided on our own volition that we, uh, we need to bring in a new law. So it's passed by Parliament after budget, which is now compulsory on government that every single cent that's collected through ECAL uh, must actually be publicly accounted for. It simply cannot go into consolidated funds. Any single, every single cent connect, uh, collected through ECAL must only go through, uh, must only go through sorry, expenditures related to environment and climate ad adaptation initiatives. And also by law now, we actually have to publish, publish and tell the public where uh, those monies have been spent. Majority of the collection of ECAL obviously comes from the tourism sector and uh, it's uh, important for us to be able to publicize this at the airports and various other places including the municipal councils and general public to know how that money is, is, uh, has been spent or will be spent. We expect to collect about $90 million uh, from ECAL uh, itself. It does not include the plastic bags by the way. Um, We've just lumped together here for you the amount of money we spend on infrastructure development, health, education, access to justice, social protection. You can see exponential growth almost three or four times than what was spent in 2004. Social protection, as you know, like for the, for the first time we have included now, uh, you know, welfare payments to persons with disabilities. We have a lot of Fijians uh, who actually, you know, have been sugarcane farmers or live in villages, pet sick, what have you. They never formally worked for anybody including women. A lot of women in Fiji, in particular the older generation, have always stayed at home or they've done some cash crop business. So when they retire or when they reach the age of 65, what have you, they actually don't have a pension to rely on. Because they, they are members of FNP. So many of these people actually la were languishing within the system itself. There's been a lot of social changes too in our country too. So a lot of traditionally in Fiji, you have your parents and you have your children. Once the parents get old, the children look after them. When the children get old, their children look after them. There's been le that level of social protection, informal social protection, that no longer exists in, in for some, most families, a number of families, I should say. So what we did a few years ago was that anybody over the age of 70, we paid them a $30, year, a $30 monthly allowance. Over the years, it's changed. We brought down the age to 68 and we gave $50. As announced in the budget, we've now kept the age to 65 and they get $100 a month for those people who don't actually 
have FNPF or have never received or paid FNPF. It's very important to be able to look after these people. Uh, access to justice, there are a number of other, of course, initiatives, you know, abandoned children, uh, people living below the poverty line, we provide uh, welfare payments to them too. But we have access to justice, which is essentially legal aid. Uh, legal aid offices are now in every single uh, urban centre, including places like Nambuwalu, and Kandabu, and Rotuma, and Ovalau, and we're expanding it further. And uh, legal aid, of course, is uh, mandatory now under the Constitution. Uh, because there's no point, ladies and gentlemen, talking about economic growth and rule of the law when it's only limited to a handful of people. The people who are below the poverty line are poor people or people who are working class people should be able to access the law too and be able to access the justice system and therefore it is very important for us to be able to have yeah, enough funding to legal aid. Legal aid commission now is what I call the largest law firm in Fiji. They have about 45 lawyers and it's, it's, it's growing also. They now do things like not just provide you know, advice or representation for criminal matters, but also the right of wills. There's also this understanding in Fiji that only the rich should write wills. I can tell you many stories where people who have passed away, they've had only one house, and you can see how everybody fights over it because there's been no will. So we are encouraging people to ensure, even the low-income people, to actually write a will. Ensure that also the legal aid now helps them with probate issues, maintenance cases, domestic violence cases, and you know, child, uh, child custody, etc. Uh, education, of course, as you know, education has become free now from early childhood to year 13. You give scholarships in the tertiary level too, and I can go into that too. You said the funding has increased. Health, one of our greatest challenges in the health system is we do not have enough specialists in Fiji, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the reason being is that because for decades and decades, in particular post independent Fiji, we have not really invested in our human capital. Uh, certain politicians in the past have said that brain drain is a fact of life, we should accept it. Well, no, our policy is that we don't accept it. We need to be able to ensure that we are able to retain our good people in Fiji. Uh, this is why doctors were given a salary rise of up to about 80% a couple of years ago, and we'll see some further announcements next week too in respect of retaining them in Fiji. You cannot, for example, have a person who's done MBBS and expect them to become a heart surgeon overnight. You need to invest in him or her, and to send them overseas. You need about 10, 15 years of experience before they can actually cut you open and play around with your heart. So we need uh, that level of investment in our human capital, and that has not happened. So that's what we are doing. We've got a Dr. Birabo now, who just come back to New Zealand. He's the first Fijian neurologist who actually can do neurological surgery. I mean, these are the kind of things that we are working on, but it takes time. So in the meantime, we need to get specialists from overseas. Of course, that is not necessarily easy. If you go down to Mumbai and try and get a specialist and say, why don't you be based in Lambasa, they'll ask you, what's the nightlife in Lambasa like? What international school is there? I mean, these are some of the challenges that you do have. It's one thing to make these, you know, people talk about, well, why don't you get somebody from overseas? You need to be able to ensure that you have the right economic and social environment to be able to attract people uh, of that caliber. Infrastructure development, of course, uh, it speaks for itself. We have unprecedented levels of investment in uh, rural electrification, water reticulated systems, and of course, in, 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 in roads too. Uh, this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you look at the expenditure mix of any government, uh, like some of your businesses, you have your capital expenditure and your operating expenditure. And you can see the comparison, the brown line there, 2004, only 17% of the total government spend for that year went into capital expenditure. And if you compare that now, as you can see, it's been increasing over the years, it's 41%. So 41% of what we spend goes into capital expenditure. So we are building for the future, and we are only borrowing to build. And that is very, very important to ensure. Which means, of course, we have tried to be you know, very uh, smart with the way that we manage our finances. Most vehicles now in government is actually leased. Before, the tradition was, when government requires vehicles, they buy it. When they buy vehicles, of course, it means further, you know, more capital outlay. It also means that every ministry now, you know, those days wanted to have a mechanic, wanted to have a garage. And if the car has an accident, then, you know, it may get parked because they don't have enough budget for that year to fix up the repairs for the car. So when the car sits there, then slowly it gets cannibalized. Somebody decides one day to come and take the carburetor, somebody takes out the spark plug, the total asset value goes down. Today, all the vehicles that we do lease actually are insured. You'll see less 
uh, of those kind of things happening now. And we're just being clever about it. And of course, the expenditure mix is very, very important for us. And this is what we keep on highlighting. Funding for roads and bridges speaks for itself, increased you know, tenfold. Uh, we need to get the quality of these uh, infrastructure up and running. As you said, we're building resilience. Traditionally, in Fiji, when they used to build roads, assuming that this is the road, traditionally would lay the water pipe underneath the road too. So when the water pipe leaks, nobody knows about it, but we get a lot of potholes. When somebody wakes up one morning and says, oh, it must be the water pipe, you dig up the road to fix up the pipe. So you actually have to damage one infrastructure to fix up the other infrastructure. So that's what we've done in Nandi, for example. As much as possible, wherever all the utilities are concerned, you move them to the side of the road, so you don't have to dig up the road to fix up the utility, but you dig up the footpath, maybe, or the side of the road. Those are the kind of things that's been happening. And of course, uh, many of the, um, those of you who are from Suva, you see the Batuanga Bridge, the Shinsen Parade Bridge. Those bridges were built in the 1970s. Why are those bridges collapsing now? Bridges, when they traditionally are built, are supposed to last 80, 90 years. So the CSR bridges are still around today. We're still using them. So we have bridges that were built in the 1970s and, and 80s that are collapsing. And some of the assessments that have been done is because there's been less steel put in it, less concrete put in it. So, you know, issues like corruption and issues of non-performance, or uh, you know, non-performance, non-management of uh, project offices, etc., are concerning that. Uh, again, water and energy, uh, you know, the subsidies that we do give. Uh, today now, anybody, any household that earns less than $30,000 a year, uh, we pay for the electricity, the tariff. We pay 50% of the tariff cost. Uh, we don't get FEA to actually pay for it. We pay FEA. So we want so the certain enterprises to be able to stand on their feet and operate like full commercial entities. Uh, and that's where the funding goes, rural electrification, grid extension. Previously, of course, people used to have to contribute 10% to get to be connected to the grid if you're in rural area. So assuming all of you lived in one area, an FEA would come along and say, okay, you want to be connected to the grid, all of you have to contribute $2,000 each. And then if half of you contributed and the other half did not contribute, it never got done. So they waited for everybody to contribute. So those monies were just sitting lying, lying idle and the grid extension never got done. We actually got rid of that, we returned the money, and he said, we'll do it on our own volition. And so this is why the rural electrification projects are taking place, but some of them, of course, will take a bit longer. Many of these rural infrastructure projects, actually, ladies and gentlemen, we actually have a, uh, there's a problem with it. The problem is we don't have enough contractors. There are only, for example, 20 licensed, about 20 licensed uh, electrical companies that have been certified by FEA to carry out this work. So obviously, if we had more companies, we could do more. In the same way, if you have more construction companies, more roading companies that meet the standards, we could do more. So we are at the moment being stopped from doing that because of the lack of uh, expertise that existed in the market. Funding for education, of course, that you can see is self-explanatory. I don't really necessarily need to read that. But coppers, of course, is very, very important. Uh, coppers are given on the uh, uh, basis of merit. Merit, ladies and gentlemen, is very, very important. You cannot have a skewed system where certain people are marginalized because of their ethnicity or their religion. All of these professionals want to be able to, even in your own organization, if you are working in your own organization, if this row of people perform well, the row behind them don't perform, but everybody gets paid the same salary, obviously it's not right. If they all go for a job, and the person gets a job simply because they belong to one particular group that has been given a favor, then obviously it's very, very disempowering for the others. So we need to be able to create a level of confidence within the marketplace, within the economy, that everybody gets treated equally because that builds a lot of confidence. People want to then contribute uh, to the economy and to the workplace. So uh, similarly, we've done with the scholarships. Uh, we don't give, for example, scholarships for people to become lawyers. There are too many lawyers. Of, uh, too many lawyers. There's a shortage, however, of surveyors, of town planners, planners, marine scientists, foresters, doctors, engineers. We don't even have a single speech therapist in Fiji. There are many things that can be done. Many. Uh, you know, redress can be provided at early, at, by early intervention. You may have a child being born with some form of slight, you know, uh, impediment, hearing or speech. So early interventions were made, they can become productive members of society very quickly or that, that impediment can be removed. But we don't even have those kind of skill sets that are available to need to build upon that. This is why nearly 75%, if not more, of the scholarships that we do give are skewed towards those areas of study because we need, for example, these people. 
funding for health, I've, I've spoken about that. Uh, again, just the operating, our operating revenue, as you can see, is all the way from uh, the top part of the blue all the way down. Operating expenditure, we have operating savings about $896 million uh, as, as we speak. Government debt, a lot of people talk about government debt without necessarily understanding it. Many um, journalists, many politicians even speak about government debt without necessarily understanding it. The line that I always say that we need to be concerned about is the red line over here, uh, which is the debt to uh, GDP ratio. Uh, nominal debt, of course, has increased. Um, out of the $5.2 billion, about $2.2 billion were incurred by previous governments. Uh, we have to, of course, pay those debts. Fiji has never defaulted on any of the debts. The example that I've used, you know, the Alliance government under Ratimara incurred debts. So when Rambuka carried out the coup, he also had to pay off those debts, and he incurred debts himself. Then came along the, the Labour government, they of course incurred debts, but they had to pay off the debts of the previous government. In the Russia government, similarly, we have to adopt all those debts, and we have to repay those debts. We have of course incurred debts uh, in our period too, but it's interesting, you can see over here in 2006, for example, nominal debt of $2.8 billion, as a percent of GDP is 53.3%. But today we have $5.2 billion, but its percent of GDP is 47.5, because the GDP has grown, the value of our GDP has grown. So basic philosophy is that as CGNs we need to be concerned about growing the pie, rather than assuming that the pie is the same size and trying to fight over the pie. The idea is to grow the pie so more people can participate, and people who already are participating can have a bigger share uh, from that actual pie itself. Uh, just by comparison, if you look at these countries, debt to GDP ratio comparisons and also the nominal debts, you can see Japan, debt to GDP ratio 239.2%. Nominal figure is $11.8 trillion. That's their debt. Uh, nobody says it's a failed economy. Uh, Singapore, USA, and very self explanatory you guys are good at figures. You can see it speaks for itself, but they all have triple ratings too. Uh, so you see, this is all uh, very, very subjective from one perspective. Uh, Fiji, of course, sits over here at 45.8. Uh, this is all in US dollars, 2.3 uh, billion dollars. Uh, countries like Samoa, you can see what they did to GDP. These are comparable countries. Maldives, Seychelles, Nauru, Mauritius, Tuvalu, Samoa, Fiji. Uh, you know, island states. And uh, uh, Mauritius is very interesting, as I mentioned, in various other seminars, some of you were present there. Mauritius, a uh, similar situation to Fiji, they're traditionally dependent on sugar. The difference, of course, is the, in Mauritius, the, the CEO of SAC is here, he'll tell you, the, all the sugarcane plantations in Mauritius, I think, are now owned by only six companies. Uh, whereas in Fiji, we have a small farmer holding. But they decided a few years ago, and they sort of did a, some sort of strategic <laughs> thinking, and said, what do we do? We simply cannot be dependent on sugar alone. They are very close to Africa. When I say close, I think about three hours or so away from Africa by flight. So they decided to model themselves. They invested very heavily in infrastructure, put in four-lane roads, built IT parks, partnered with Indian hospitals. So now they actually offer themselves really as a haven from South Africa. So they invited international companies. They said, why don't you set up shop here to service Africa? So a lot of international companies actually are based in Mauritius to service Africa. A lot of rich Africans or other Africans who seek medical services don't necessarily have to go to Europe or India for medical services because Indian hospitals have been brought into Mauritius. If you want to have open heart surgery, you come to Mauritius. So these are the things that have to remodel themselves, but they incur debt. So the point of the story is this. It's good to incur debt. It, of course, you have the capacity to incur that debt. But if it goes towards productive use, it is, it is going to increase the productivity. It's very, very important. The simple example that I've been using with the school students. Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> that I've been using with the school students is that we have, for example, a, a villager or fisherman in Fiji who goes and catches fish. They don't have electricity, so when they catch fish, they sell fish to you by the roadside. They may say to you, you know, whatever X number of dollars a bundle. They aren't able to sell the fish by the end of the day. They know the fish will go bad. So they bring down the price of the fish. Now, if they, don't, if they still can't sell the fish, they either have to eat it themselves or they actually give it away. 
But the moment you connect them with electricity, they won't bring down the price of the fish. You say, no, they can keep the fish in the cooler. Next day, they put the same fish out, throw some fresh water on it, you drive past, they say, fresh fish for sale. But they have not brought down their price. So what you have done is actually by connecting them to electricity, you've increased the level of income. Very simple as that. And we've seen that actually happen in real life. So it's increasing the productive capacity, increasing the livelihoods of these people in terms of the income levels. Similarly, that's what we need to look at a macro level as far as the country is concerned. Uh, and that, of course, puts into perspective. In Australia, for example, you know, 41.1% of GDP, but the debt, of course, exposure is, you know, $517.3 billion. In nominal terms are higher than ours, of course. Again, for debt to GDP comparisons. Uh, I, I don't know whether I want to, I should go into that. I don't think we should. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, because I understand there's more questions to be asked. But what I wanted to just highlight to you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the two bills that were passed in Parliament today, as you know that we have been uh, continuously saying to uh, FRCS that there is still a lot of debt uh, leakage, in, uh, sorry, revenue leakage in Fiji. There's a World Bank study that was done um, a, couple of years, a few years ago that said that about one third of the value of our GDP is in the black economy. Uh, so there are a lot of people actually who aren't paying the right level of taxes or aren't paying any taxes at all when they actually should be paying the taxes. Uh, we have of course increased penalties. There are another other number of measures have been put in place. There's a lot of what I call reverse uh, transfer pricing. There's also transfer pricing that does take place. Today Parliament approved two laws, uh, amendments to the existing laws. And uh, they actually include, uh, one of the first one is actually the, what we call the uh, the name and shame, uh, which essentially now empowers FRCS to name companies that are actually uh, companies that have a gross turnover of $1.5 million or more. Um, if they've made an error in the submission of any document or information required by the service, which is FRCS, for tax returns, any document or information required for custom purposes, or fail to comply with any tax or obligation under any law specified in Schedule 1, which is the list of companies that will say will actually fall in this category, then they can actually publish in the name of the company. So it's a name and change. Uh, they have similar laws in South Africa, uh, they have similar laws in, in Australia, and there are various other jurisdictions where they do do that. So this law uh, will come into effect as soon as we get it gazetted uh, formally, uh, once it's uh, essentially the President assents to that. Similarly, it will apply to tax agents um, or customs agents where they made an error in the submission of any document or information required the, by FRCS. Then if you do breach that, then your names of those tax agents and uh, customs agents will, can be published by FRCS. But again, the threshold of $1.5 million uh, gross turnover does apply and of course you have to be listed in the schedule. Uh, the other one, uh, of course, there's a, if, if there is a mistake being made, you can have that retracted. There's those provisions and protections that have been put in place. The other one, of course, ladies and gentlemen, is um, under the Tax Administration Act. Uh, currently, there is a uh, provision in the law, or there was until now, that if you, for example, pay penalties, you also cannot be prosecuted. Uh, that has stopped now, once this law comes into effect. Uh, you can actually have both. You pay the penalty, you can also be prosecuted at the same time, not either or. Again, the similar provisions exist in other similar jurisdictions, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, UK. Uh, so we put those provisions in place, ladies and gentlemen, I, and I ask you to have a look at these provisions very, very closely. They're not necessarily very complicated at all, they're simple amendments, but it does give FRCS the ability to do that. And we've actually come to a point, ladies and gentlemen, where we've had to do that. There's still a number of fundamental breaches a number of, of your clients, not necessarily your clients per se, but a number of tax payers in Fiji, the chargeable income that they, they show is actually quite ludicrous compared to the lifestyles they, re, they lead. If you see the amount of people they employ in their house, working as housemaids or gardeners, etc., the amount of salaries that they pay to them is more than what they actually show is their chargeable income. The lifestyle that people lead, the amount of times that they travel, the acquisitions that they do have, is quite phenomenally in a very different to what they actually show is the income. 
So we have actually been pushed uh, to be able to bring this provision, but we believe it is good. Um, as I said, as the time and time again, as professionals, we need to, of course, have a fire issue, you have a fire issue duty to your client, but it's not at the expense of the state. It's not at the expense of you somehow or the other breaching the laws. We've had an accounting firm recently where the client of days had to pay some penalties to FRCS, and as you know, penalties are not chargeable income. They actually, uh, or taxable income, they actually then showed that as an expense. So they could actually get away with it. Unacceptable. Countries like Singapore aren't where they are today because people have been doing, uh, having a laser affair to the, to the laws of their country. If you talk to professionals in countries like Singapore, they'll all ensure that every client of theirs actually adheres to the laws of their country. That's the only way we can progress as a country. We're asking people to please make lots of money. Your businesses, your clients, do that. Provide the services, provide the goods. We need that. But we need to be compliant with the laws of the country. So uh, these are the new provisions, ladies and gentlemen. Again, like I'd like to probably just summarize. I know I'm the last speaker at the end of the day, so it's probably you want me to get off the podium very quickly. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we are providing an enabling environment uh, for businesses to thrive. We are providing an enable, enabling environment for individuals to actually excel within the country itself. We are now providing greater opportunities than ever before. We have a huge focus into the future. We are looking at some very good initiatives in, in terms of medical area, uh, getting private sector involved in some uh, public-private partnerships. And that will again provide a huge level of investment, huge level of what do I call ancillary um, uh, services that can develop from some of these products and some of these PPPs that we do want to develop. It's an exciting time. You as professionals uh, we should have increased work. Uh, we urge all of you, most of you are probably in this room, except probably the front row, are in what I call the majority. 69.4% of the population in Fiji is below the age of 40. For those of you who are below the age of 40, you're in the majority. People like myself are in the minority. And we need to be able to harness your energy, those of you below the age of 40. Of course, those over 40, they want to harness your energy too, but more so the younger ones. You have a great future ahead of you. We want you to give us that intellectual input. You have that firepower, and you need to be able to create an enabling environment for you to do well. And we have a great future ahead of us, ladies and gentlemen, as long as there's consistency in policy. As long as we stay on this trajectory that we are on without any deviation uh, from these policies. So thank you very much for the invitation, ladies and gentlemen, and, uh, and I wish you a good afternoon. Thanks.